Hey there, all you ghouls and goblins. Radio 85.9 proudly presents Horror Zoid with your hosts, Stevie Scares and Natalie Nightmare, talking all things horror from the 80s, 90s, and today. Today's episode is brought to you by the Transparent Tank Top. Are you a ghoul who wants to show off the guns? Get the Transparent Tank Top. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Horror Zoid. I'm Stevie Scares. And I'm Natalie Nightmare. And we are talking about all things about ghost movies. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. So any movie, basically, where somebody has moved on to the spirit realm, uh, dearly departed from this world, yes. or just stuck in between worlds, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that's what uh, that's what the ground we're going to be covering with this episode. And we realized um, again, there's there's kind of a weird, you know, you mentioned passing on, and there's a lot of uh, movies that we couldn't quite say are they a ghost movie or are they not a ghost movie, just because of what else entails in them. Right, and I think we even discussed maybe like covering different things in this episode, which we definitely will, but. Mm-hmm. What constitutes a ghost movie? I think that's right. why we wanted to leave it broad. broad. We just wanted to leave it kind of uh, to where we could cover a wide range of movies. But yeah, I think ghosts definitely describes kind of what we're going to be talking about here again. Yeah. Basically, it involves death. Uh, sometimes it can be rather morose and macabre, as you'll see mm-hmm. with some of them. Mm-hmm. Some of them can actually even be humorous. Uh, right. I mean, we were talking uh the other day about this and how many movies as kids or not even movies necessarily, but also TV shows, you know, we had Casper, the friendly ghost. Uh, we had Beetlejuice, Goosebumps, had Ghostbusters. Exactly. Goosebumps. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you afraid of the dark? And even if a very niche thing here, PBS show called ghost writer. Oh uh, yeah. Which, uh, spirit helped kids solve mysteries. So, I mean, it's, It's all over the place. It was everywhere when we were kids. And, you know, we've kind of come into a new era of the spooky shit, which is what we want to fucking talk about today. That's right. All spooky shit all the time. That's our t-shirt right there. (laughs) When we do merch, all all spooky shit all the time. Merch drop. That's it. Make notes. That's right. Uh, but yeah, so that's that, that's again, we're going to be covering a wide range of movies today. Kind of, again, a broader topic. So if you're sitting there and you're like... If you think it might not fit the topic, I guarantee you think about it again. This is yeah. that's why we wanted to leave it a little bit more open. Uh, so yeah, ghost movies. Uh, some of my favorites uh, through that I, I love stories about. I, I like stories about death. It's weird. It, yeah. It's it's like I said. It's kind of macabre with some of these, and I like. Yeah. But I think it's one of those things that we're. It teaches us lessons about death. A lot of mm-hmm. these are kind of almost like fables in a way yeah, that we'll 100%. talk about today. Uh, they're supposed to be kind of these stories to teach us uh, maybe to appreciate life mm-hmm. um, and to that uh, people who are stuck in these between worlds and stuff. It's, you know, it makes us appreciate what we have here in life a little bit more. That's why. And I think that's that's what I take away from a lot of the movies we're going to talk about today. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, that's just kind of one of those themes that I think you'll notice throughout all of the films that we've picked. Um, I was like covering what we like about the genre yeah. because then I think you kind of see that as a through line as to why we picked the movies that we picked mm-hmm. and why we didn't pick some of the other movies that you may think are more deserving to be talked about. Right. Which, you know, as always, we would love to hear those from you guys. Uh, you can contact us if you go to horrorzoid.com. There's all of our links and contacts there. Yep. Um, horrorzoidpod at gmail.com. Email us, go. drop us a line. And of course we're on TikTok. So yeah, hit us up. Yeah. Hundred yeah, percent. We, we love hear, hearing it. We want to hear, and you know, we've had a few movies that people have mentioned on, for some of our last few episodes that we've never seen uh, that have gone onto our watch list. So if there's a ghost movie out there that we don't mention, let us know. We want to watch it. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, you're talking about your favorite uh, movies. What would you say? You know, it seems like you kind of lean towards the sad, dreary kind of ghost stories, and mm-hmm. not just like crazy psycho ghosts. So what? What do you? think would be your favorite for those then my favorite ghost movie it's funny it's i love when we break it down into genres like this because Mm -hmm. it's not it's for me 
it, my favorite film of all time is obviously, like I said, Psycho. But when it mm-hmm. comes to those other genres, it kind of is very, it's a revolving door. It's, you could I, almost I do a them. whole family tree of horror movies. Of course. Like you start with your favorite five and then you just branch off. You know, what are your favorite ghost movies? What are your favorite demon movies? Right. Vamp, you know, we've done vampires. Vampires, yes, absolutely. Like, I love I love being able to break it down into yeah. a niche thing like that. I agree. I think probably the best ghost movie I've seen lately is probably Crimson Peak. That would oh, pro- that would yeah. that's that's very high on my list right now. Yeah, and I feel like um, it was pretty underrated. But oh, yeah. honestly, I mean the visuals alone. Uh, of course, you have one of our favorite spooky people who plays a lot of spooky people. Uh, uh, Botet uh, does Javier Botet. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm <sighs> shit at names. No, um, Javier yeah, Botet. Javier and Botet. actually, he's gonna pop up on our show later uh, today because we're gonna talk about another movie yeah. with Javier Botet. Yeah. So yes. You're going to find out through this show. We fucking love us some Javier Botet. Yes, he's he is, amazing. Uh, he's a horror hero. He is. Um, he really and, is. And he's been in some of our favorite movies. So between him and yeah. Doug Jones, I think they've got yeah. the the spindly characters who are either creepy or lovable down very yeah. well. And if you don't know who Javier Botet is, uh, he plays the 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 prevalent ghost in the movie that we mm-hmm. see the prevalent spirit yes. that we see throughout Crimson Peak, mm-hmm. um, but Crimson Peak is a beautiful movie. Of course, it's Guillermo del Toro, mm-hmm. uh, stars Tom Hiddleston, Jessica <sighs> Chastain, and yeah. uh, oh my Two god, beautiful people, I'm very gonna awkward butcher the pronunciation of the name, but uh, Mia Wasikowska, I want to say is how you pronounce it, but mm-hmm. she's been in a lot of our favorite movies, as yeah. we mentioned, Lo- Only Lovers Left Alive, so mm-hmm. she's a favorite of ours. She's uh, Alice from Alice in Wonderland, for those of you who don't know. But in Crimson Peak, it's the story of uh, this girl played by Mia Wasikowska, and she... Uh, her father is a wealthy man, and uh, she uh, very much is resistant to the idea of marriage, and uh, is very close to her father. And it's just, but again, that's all she really needs until this handsome stranger, played by none other than the uh, dreamy <laughs> Tom Hiddleston, shows up and uh, seduces her and tries to lure her off to England to his castle, and only the castle is haunted. Oh. <laughs> And his sister's really weird, played by Jessica Chastain. Yeah, but it is, uh, uh, there's there's a very bizarre relationship, as I was kind of yep. saying. But it is a very is a very beautiful, aesthetically pleasing movie. Right, it's Del Toro. Yeah, I mean, so you, get you know the what cool, to expect. You get the cool architecture. Uh, you get the cool, moody. You know, just everything. All the set design, everything's beautiful. The wardrobes phenomenal. It's a very beautiful movie, and even though it's weird, it's definitely. Definitely worth it. And it's got some good jump scares in it, too. And I think one thing I love about this is they do the ghosts well. And I think one thing that we should really talk about before we move on too far is the design of ghosts in these films. Yeah. Because Crimson Peak, for instance, while we're talking about that, it does one thing that I love. And I think it gets trashed in movies, but I don't think it deserves to be trashed because it's such a guilty pleasure of mine in these ghost movies. They do that kind of wispy, ethereal yes. ghost. Yes. Uh, like, look, like the ghosts in this movie <laughs> totally look like when you were seven years old, what you imagined mm-hmm. a ghost would look like. That, to me, right. is what a ghost looks like when I picture a phantasm right. of any kind out there. We, we kind of picture the, your typical Halloween ghost. You know, you you drive by and everyone's decorating for Halloween and there's those little ghosts hanging from the porches and they're blowing in the wind. It's like that. Like they're just these misty things and they're just really, really cool. And they're all red looking. So. Well that, but I, there's, there's some that aren't and right. the ones that aren't are pretty damn impressive. The yes. way that what they've done with CGI Guillermo del Toro has a way with special effects that I don't think anybody else has. Uh, it's just he, everything you're, he sucks you in and everything is so believable. Yeah. And you would never know that these things that are special effects and visual effects are not the exact same thing as what we're seeing with the actors like Chastain and Hiddleston and mm-hmm. Mia Wasikowska. Like, that's one thing you would not... like. You, if you told me those were not together, like they weren't seeing those things when they were acting in those scenes, I would have told you bullshit. Yeah, and that's another reason I think it's it's such an underrated movie. Yeah, like the fact that the visual effects, because what is this, 2000, what, this was a while ago, 2015? Yeah, 2014 yeah. even? Probably about that yeah. time. Mm-hmm. And and I, I know that sounds weird to say because it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, no. but look at the Marvel movies yeah. and how far <laughs> they've come. And the visual effects that you see in Crimson Peak, for it being this kind of beautiful, romantic, gothic horror movie, mm-hmm. has some of the best visual effects I've seen in any film uh, in the last 10 years easily. Yeah. And going off of, you know, you're talking about effects and the yes. way the ghosts look. 
Um, I would have to say my favorite isn't actually a movie. It's a show. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of people have watched this and it's probably the f- their favorite of his work. But Haunting on Hill House, the Netflix series right. by Mike Flanagan... I just, to me, a movie can't even beat it. It's And I know, you know, it, it benefits from being a series. It has a lot to build on. Yeah, the episodic nature of, right. of the television structure really lent itself to the way Mike Flanagan could tell those stories in uh, Haunting of Hill House. Yeah, but the fact that, you know, you, you start with, you know, the typical, the obvious ghosts that you're supposed to see in the house. But the fact that, you know, me and you, the first time we watched it, there were a few moments where like, wait, rewind that. Did I see that in the background? And then I've probably watched this show start to finish seven, eight, probably even nine times at this point since it's come out. I just love it that much. I would turn it on, just let it be on, um, constantly cry when I would cry the first time, constantly be terrified of the jump scare in the car. You know what I'm talking about if you've seen it. But the, the coolest thing is like you literally see a ghost in that show in the first 10 seconds of the opening hiding behind the stairwell and from then every scene in that show is like a where's waldo there's so many ghosts that you see in the background that aren't even supposed to be interacted with they're just dotted in the background and i absolutely love that Uh, i i agree i think mike flanagan is probably up there with james wan as far as directors the way they're able to play with the periphery Mm -hmm. the way those two are i i think it, it it is masterful the way they're able to do that in their works. And Mike Flanagan, it really shows in uh, uh, Hill House and Bly Manor both. Yeah. He plays with the background and the periphery so well. Like your your eye is obviously drawn to the characters and the acting and the performance, but mm-hmm. it, it requires second viewing, which I think is genius on his part. Yeah. Uh, to make it so that you almost have to watch it multiple times in order to see and, and fully uh, get the effect of everything. And, right. You know, so thankfully that's why we, uh, we've watched it though, both of them <laughs> as many times as we have. Yeah. And we own them on Blu-ray. It's like those two series, uh, They're Mike Slant again, the way he, way he does ghosts is also one thing I, I, before we move on, I want to talk about the strength of what he does with ghosts. Mm-hmm. And he does this in a lot of his work in Oculus. I was going to say, Before Oculus is also a ghost story. Yeah, Oculus, Before I Wake, ghost story. Like, Mike Flanagan is a genius at telling ghost stories, but mm-hmm. Oculus, Before I Wake, um, even things like Ouija, too, you know, oh, some yeah. of his work. We're going to talk a whole whole lot about Mike Flanagan. <laughs> but anyway, my point is, um, what he does best is he makes the death part of becoming a ghost. He makes the transition from life to death one of the most impactful things that I have seen in in this any of like these ghost narratives, these spiritual narratives that we see. Because mm-hmm. we always focus on we I feel like most films and TV either focus on the life before they died mm-hmm. or their afterlife now that they are spirits. Right. Mike Flanagan focuses on the transition, that middle part, the death he does. itself. And he makes that mean something and he makes right. it he, he just makes it the most significant part of the story. Mm-hmm. And I think that if you watch any of his work, even Midnight Mass, oh, which is yeah. not ghosts. Not ghosts. I'm not going to give still, away what it is, he but still it's not does ghosts. Right. And he still makes the death, yeah. the death meaningful. And I, I think, think that's that a brilliant a thing hero. to point out. That's a brilliant thing to point out because as you're saying that, and I'm thinking Haunting on Hill House, you go through multiple episodes of Nell alive, Nell not alive, Nell in between. And you even but get you those... ask anybody what the, the the most meaningful episode and part of her journey is what right. what what it was exactly they're exactly. going to tell you the exact same thing. But just even like with, down just to the with, the, with, yeah. the funeral home episode where and this is one that even the first time you watch it, some people don't even notice as it pans through. You see Nell standing in the back of the funeral parlor, looking at them, look at her in a coffin. Yeah, and like it's twisted. It's, it is. But, but it's in a, in a very beautiful way. Right. He doesn't, I mean, yes, he does have, you know, especially going into Bly Manor and even some of the ones in Hill House that are really creepy. Um, you know, the the plague doctor and, and Bly Manor being probably one of my favorites because every time you see his pointy, you know, mask oh, yeah. and his hat in the background in the shadows is super creepy. So well done. But, you know, he does focus on the human aspect of a lot of these characters and builds a lot of emotion to them that you know most of these ghosts you really really love 
Yeah, you do. Yeah, you become attached to a lot of the the characters. I think one of the best ones that I remember is Bl- like you love Hill House. Mm-hmm. I actually think I like Blind Manor more than I like I Hill love House. Blind and Manor. I'll tell you, one of my favorite episodes is the episode about Hannah. Hannah being one of the most tragic characters in any of Mike Flanagan's work. So yeah, it's TV. Yeah, like we said, it's not necessarily a movie, but my goodness, it's like it's hard not to talk about Mike Flanagan when you're talking about ghost stories, right? Because he is the, in my opinion, you know, at the moment he's the, he's the master. He yes, is he the is. master of telling ghost stories in film mm-hmm. right now. I a hundred percent agree. Because even though you know his films have been kind of all over the place, like Hush is a you know, kind of a uh, slasher, slasher, home invasion kind of thing. Right. Um, you know, we already mentioned Oculus, which is a ghost story. Really brilliant. Yeah. Before ghost I story. wake is another one of his that I absolutely See, and love. That one I've still never seen. I think that's you, like, no, one of you, the... you watched it with me. Did we? Yeah, we did. <laughs> it was a very, it was probably one of Mike Flanagan's most forgettable movies. That's probably why but I'm it was the one it. You, you, you'll remember. It's the one where, um, the kid can like, he dreams. Remember? Oh, yes. He, okay. He dreams. It's the, the little, kid who dreams. If you, all right. Yeah. See, the name of the movie, I was not putting right. it to it's, that. Remember Tom Jane yes. has the awful hair in the movie? <laughs> that's that's how we keep track of which movie say, Before I Wake is because I fucking hate Tom <laughs> Jane and his hair in that I was movie. So you could have said him or the there's the scene with all the butterflies. The I butterflies, yes. It was the butterfly movie and that Mike Flanagan So Okay. Did. So, yes. I For some reason, the name was not clicking with me. Really? Um, yeah. What's but the... <laughs> <laughs> but now that you said it, I remember, uh, you know, I remember the little kid. And it, Please let us know if you guys have a movie where you're like, you, somebody says the title and you're like, bro, I got no fucking clue. Well, like, please let reason, us know if you have those two. Because I think we all have that where it's like, you say the title, no idea. You tell me the plot. Oh, yeah, I remember that movie. Yeah. Uh, please drop us online name, about that. but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I know her face. I don't know her name. Thank you, John Cook. So... You know, you were kind of talking about how Flanagan, um, you know, is really good at telling the transition. And it made me think a movie that we've recently watched, I think within the last year, that does a brilliant, brilliant job of doing that exact same thing um, is a movie called A Ghost Waits. A Ghost Waits is absolutely one of my favorite movies. I've said it. I've gone on record several times that It Follows is probably the best horror movie to come out in the last 10 years, and I stand by that, A Ghost Waits would probably be my number two or three. And, I, and, I, it's, and I'll tell you absolutely why. It is a ghost story. It's a, also a love story. Yes. It's, it's a, and not like those weird stories of like the lady that married her ghost. Like right. she said there was a ghost in her house and she got married to him. Well, and yeah. even like no, we just no, talked like, about Crimson Peak. Crimson Peak is a romantic ghost story as well. Right. But this is more romantic comedy. So, and I know everybody's like, already you're hearing that. You're like, if you have not seen this movie and you hear it's a ghost story and a romantic comedy, you're going to be like, I'm not watching that. But trust me, watch it. It is just one of the most beautiful, quirky fun, enthusiastic, yet macabre, dark, and sullen movies that I've mm-hmm. ever seen. I don't know how it perfectly encapsulates <laughs> two sides of a very of, of a very different coin, but yeah. it does it so masterfully. It really does. And, um, you know, you get a lot of beautiful... I think whenever you can film a movie in black and white, it says a lot about your directing, um, you know, because you could do color, you could do you know, the biggest and the best, but you chose to do black and white, which a lot of people may, may think it makes it seem dated. But there's something about, oh God, the way he does the lighting in that movie, um, you know, whenever the ghost appears and she always looks like she's, you know, kind of up and hovering sometimes because she can do that. And the lighting makes her look ghostly. Yeah. Uh, director Adam Stovall does a uh, tremendous job yeah. with, uh, with the cinematography, um, as Natalie pointed mm-hmm. out. Um, the directing of the actors, because the actors, if you look at it, uh, none of them have like uh, a long list of, of films behind them. They're mm-hmm. not rookies by any means, but they don't have the lo- the biggest resume. And so, it is the, such a small cast too, because there's is. a couple of characters that mean nothing in the movie. Yeah, but you, it's mainly these these two. Right, and and it is it's it's and it's very theatrical in the way that it feels like a play almost because you do you yeah. have two main leads. The sets, the set design is very, uh, looks like very high school theater, but in a very, very romantic, very charismatic, very youthful way. Not like in a sloppy way, but no, it gives no. it this 
this youthful energy, this almost grassroots kind of feel to it where you almost feel like you're watching a film. Your buddy sent you and said, hey, man, what do you think? And you're just like, this is art, man. This is, this is. is, what, this is what art. And so Adam Stovall, I give my hats off to him because mm -hmm. he has done such a a great job with with the ghost weights it is yeah. literally one of the most beautiful pieces of cinema i've seen in the last 10 it years it is it's uh probably my favorite romance movie yeah. that i've watched yeah. in the last few it years it is so romantic because there's nothing particularly you know scary about it but there is a bit of a horrific sadness i guess is the way yeah, that i yeah. can put it um, and you know, a good maybe, ghost movie has to have sadness, right? Maybe a slight trigger warning, um, for unaliving. Yes. But, we said, we said, yes. Self unaliving. But yes. It's, we, we, we saw, yeah, we, we said that last week in yeah. our last episode that we want to be more mindful about giving trigger yeah. warnings to people. So yeah. yes. And if, and if especially you, especially if it's a more obscure movie, like yes. most people know, you know, kind of what they're getting into if they're going to watch, I spit on your grave. Yes. But you know, yeah. this is a movie that has, it does have a self unaliving scene, but it also doesn't make it too over the top graphic. Right. It's not it's violent. More, it's not anything like yeah. that. It's it's very uh, it's very much a uh, it, it handles it in a very mature and very tame way, but but not to the point where you feel like it doesn't fit the narrative. Right. It feels exactly. like it still fits everything. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of saying it. Um, you know, I I just watched it and I thought it was sad, but it didn't disturb me i guess right. is a way to put right. it right it's not it is it's not there's not really anything disturbing about no. it It doesn't push the limits in that way because it does try to focus more it, it very much swings the pendulum in the middle mm -hmm. of being cute but also being dark so it's like but it, it's very masterful the way yeah. it does it i would almost compare it to the work of tim burton like i feel like it feels very yeah. but not this is gonna sound really <laughs> fucked up and not the pretentious tim burton way but right. more like when Tim Burton was still creating artistic shit. Yeah. Not like commercial shit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it feels like Tim Burton at the beginning of his career. So if Adam Stovall goes on to have like a Tim Burton-esque career, right. I'm sure he's not going to mind. I was going to say, I want more from him, definitely. Yep. Um, you know, I was I had to pull up his name because he's not done a lot. No, I he hasn't. Either. No, again, not and, a long resume for any of the people involved right. with this film, but I love that. We're but it's a, a very highly new... rated movie. The yes. music's great. The visuals are great. It's definitely one to watch. And, and, all, and one thing I want to say about it before we move on uh -huh. is I think it's probably the closest thing we've ever had to Clerks since Clerks came oh, out yeah. because it's a low budget. It's black and white. Right. Like, what's the easiest set design that you can pick? Uh, a contractor who's going to go into a vacant house right. and fix it. Like, like almost you, you just tell these guys walked up with a camera crew yeah. and they're like, found the first vacant house. Like, this shit will do. Right. <laughs> it's right. like, let's just film this here. Yeah. There's very uh, few scenes of the house that has like furniture and stuff in it and not really any scenes out of the house. Right. I think it feels very resourceful. Like, yeah. like so like when Kevin Smith talks about mm -hmm what he went through to film clerks. Like I, if, if Adam Stovall told me the same thing, I would be like, yeah, totally believable that you had to go through all of that. Like, cause yeah. it just has that indie feel to it, mm -hmm. which again, you feel like, like we bought it from arrow video. So we, you know, we like, we love giving our money to small artists and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and hopefully, you know, it's like, I don't, I wouldn't say he's like, they're too terribly too small if they're with arrow video, but you know, it's like one of those things where you feel good about supporting the artist and mm -hmm. the art that they're creating when you're able to actually give your money to uh, to these creators like this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to I was thinking of something as you were talking about the uh, self unaliving kind of being sad and not disturbing. Um, we're going to kind of I'm going to shoehorn this in a little bit. We've talked about kind of mentioning a new movie that we've watched this week, not necessarily a new release. But one that I had not seen until yesterday uh, that Steven absolutely loves and has wanted to show me is a fantastic movie called The Orphanage. And it uh, disturbed me a little bit, but I think that's obviously what is very intended with that movie. I'm just gonna say what it is. It's it's got some dead yeah. fucking kids in it, man. <laughs> it's like look yeah. and I'll tell you straight up, I love I love movies. I love movies where it's like, because if you give dead kids, it's like, it's one of those things. If you can do that right, because it is like, like Natalie well, said, like, I'm Everyone's scariest scene with a kid right. is Pet Cemetery. Like, everyone's terrified yeah. of the truck hitting Gage yeah. scene. Like, like I, and I joke about it, but at the same time, it's like, that's one of those things that is like, 
it's easy to play on people's emotions. You can do it very cheaply, mm -hmm. as we've seen in some movies where you kill kids and it's like, oh, you just did that to get a rise out of the audience. Right. But if you do kill it, like I said, I joke, but if you can do it right, if you can if you can really yeah. pull on people's heartstrings and, and play on that emotion, mm -hmm. then uh, kudos to you. And, and this movie definitely does that. Yeah, and I don't want to entirely spoil it. I hope a lot of people, um, well, I hope, a lot of people have seen it, but I hope there's new people that listen to this who've not seen it who decides to give it a watch. Because yeah. The um, Orphanage is directed by J.A. Bayona. Mm -hmm. um, it's produced by Guillermo del Toro, so it's got that Guillermo del Toro feel to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but this movie came back came out back in 2007. It was a production by three countries, Spain, Mexico, and the United States of America. All had a hand in making it. And it shows because it, it, a, a, it is a masterly masterfully done movie if i can i know i'm going to use that word a lot with these because these are just very uh, i love these movies i think the way you, these movies are done are very artistic especially the orphanage mm -hmm. um but it's about a, a woman named laura and she is uh she was she grows up as an orphan um and when she is old enough she and her husband decide to purchase the building where the orphanage was when she was younger mm -hmm. and they take their young child uh, with them uh, on this journey and they plan to open it up to six kids who have disabilities and make it a kind of a nice uh, house for everybody to live where they can take care of these kids who have some special needs mm -hmm. um, and of course the day the kids arrive for this uh, for this new venture by Laura and her husband Carlos uh, their son goes missing and from there it is one of the most disturbing ghost movies I think yes. you will see yeah and and again, disturbing in a different way because first off, we all know kids are creepy. Like it's it's just we talked creepy. about it when we were talking about paranormal activity. <laughs> yeah, fucking kids, fucking kids are creepy. And horror movies are the creepiest shit you can ever you know, find. One of one of the biggest uh, uh, ghost movies, Poltergeist. I mean, who wasn't terrified? Fucking little girl kids. turning around, going, "They're here!" Yeah, or yeah, they're exactly. back. Yeah, like it's just. I mean, it was always so creepy so you know having these little ghost kids and the, the little boy who has imaginary friends uh but clearly they're actually little ghost children um it just gets really freaky and it goes down a, a dramatic rabbit hole of the dad kind of giving up after nine months without their son right and the mom just desperate to keep going and looking for every single clue she can every lead she can every contact everything and um you know down to where it clearly starts to affect their marriage even yeah um and you just get this absolutely gut-wrenching ending and oh, it, yeah, it just it's, it's a twist you that want a trigger I didn't warning expect. there's yeah it's yeah. like dead kids <laughs> self unaliving it is yes. a hard-hitting fucking movie it like, is it's and a rough uh movie. and, there, and it uh, actually has a scene in it that's actually relatively gory too for compared to the rest of the film it does so uh, be there's aware a this is a accident scene yeah, we're yeah, just car gonna say that scene, yeah. um so it's kind of you know that kind of reminds me of you know bright burn there's the, the quick scene with the jaw yeah, yeah um of course. so just know that there there is a little bit of gore and there's a little bit of jump scares and there's a definite uh, dramatic ending that's yep. pretty painful and gut-wrenching and even for me a little difficult to watch but uh that's mainly because the things that are really scary to me are just the shit that can really happen exactly and that's what it preys upon and yeah. one thing again i want to point out one of the strengths of this movie is that they get both sides of life and death very yeah. well they do it very well in in in, in especially the life part like you talk mm -hmm. about affecting the marriage between laura and carlos mm -hmm. it is very hard to watch and yeah. and um, that side alone, because it does feel very real, like these mm -hmm. people are going through a real experience of losing their child. Right. And um, I mean, you know, you know, as parents, mm -hmm. uh, that would be the most traumatic thing for, for you to, you know, to lose one of your children. Right. And, you know, not knowing where they are and just looking for either finding them or having some sort of closure, even if they've been found, you know, dead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, Which side is, it's it's a journey a very, for closure, yes. Right. It's a very rough tension that goes through the movie that's honestly scarier than any of the ghosts. Yeah, and uh, uh, definitely last thing I really want to point out before we move on is uh, uh, the lead performance by actress Belen Rueda mm -hmm. is uh, just a, a performance unlike any other. It She delivers 100% human emotion here, 
and in a, in a real way, which again, if you can bring that realistic aspect to something so supernatural, paranormal and out of this world, yeah. if you can ground it in reality, which is exactly what her performance does, I think that is what this movie hinges upon right. is her ability to keep you grounded in reality with this very realistic performance of like what Natalie said, this is a real thing that people go through, mm -hmm. you know, losing a child and the orphanage tackles that subject in such a way that it's like, it's almost like the fact that they make it paranormal and ghostly right. is almost like their way of sugarcoating this message of something harsh and real. And I say, I don't say sugarcoating in a, as an insult. It's almost like mm -hmm. they're trying to make it more palatable yeah. for people to digest. Well, and I'm going to mention, we posted a video as of recording this, asking to kind of guess what this week's episode is. Oh, gosh. Be. You know, and we're talking about the family issues here, and I did not realize, I promise you guys, I picked seven, eight movie posters, put them together, asked people to guess what they all had in common. And I get the comment, Absentee Parents by Bella Lugosley. Bella Lugosley. Shout out to Bella Lugosley. One of our so favorite much. followers and mutuals yes. that we have on TikTok. Always, always interacting. Just fantastic. They are, they are amazing. Please yes. go follow them. They yes. are they are so good. 100%. Um, and I looked at the comment and then I'm watching the video and I realized, holy shit, everyone I picked is a ghost story that has a relation to a family trauma. Right. It's not the babysitter's club. It's the shitty parents club. Right. Or the shitty family club. It's you like know, all of these are the, like, it's like, you want to make a ghost? You just got to have a shitty family member. Right. Because <laughs> I, I don't even know how I did it. So one of the ones that I put in there was Orphan. Uh, the other one was Crimson Peak, which in that movie, she, there is a death of a family member, a parent. Um, the other one that I had on there, which is one of my personal favorites, Juon or the grudge, um, again, uh, dad murders his family. Uh, you have angry ghosts in a traumatic situation that stay around and cause craziness. Yeah, the ring, uh, the Oculus we mentioned, they have issues with their parents. Yep. Um, the conjuring is the other one that I put on there and they have issues with their family. Yeah. Um, the other one, Mama, uh, kind of speaks for itself there, but that's uh, a fantastic ghost movie that honestly is really high on my creep factor just because the fucking noises that they make, and we're going to come back to this one, but also Missing Parents, yep. um, 1408, Shitty Dad, and the other one, His House, which uh, is another movie on Netflix that takes another spin on the ghost story by adding in... And the Shitty Parents story. And, and the Shitty like, Parents. Like, it... it like takes everything you would expect and flips it on its ear. Right. I love his house. Like if you have Netflix, which, you know, of course I'm sure most people or do. You or you got someone you can or you got somebody's on. password, yo. Yeah. If you got that, definitely check out his house. Yes. It is. Um, first off, you get two uh, leads who are people of color mm -hmm. and it's like, and it really puts them at the forefront and I'm all for that. Yeah. I think we need to see more of that in horror. Yeah. And it does that. It does, So that does a great thing there. Uh, but again, it tells these stories like it is a ghost story. These people are clearly haunted. But mm -hmm. in the end, when you realize what they're haunted by is honestly way more disturbing and way more fucked up than if it yeah. was a true traditional ghost like what we are used to. Right. And, you know, so that's something that's really, really cool is um, you have these refugees who um, escape. I was pulling it up to see the country. A war torn South Sudan. Yeah, um, yeah, very so they, real, very real subject matter yes. too. By the way, like that's yes. another thing that some of the that a lot of our favorites will hit upon real world shit. Right, and maybe that's why we think they're scarier. You know, as I was saying, you're scared of the shit that can really happen. So you you've got this war, um, and then they're they end up in this English town in a shitty little duplex, and the hauntings start. Um, but and of course, because they moved into this new place, you immediately right. think this place is haunted. Yeah, they're they're it's given a little bit of place that's haunted. <laughs> it's not the house that's haunted. It's your son. It's your son. No, in this case, it's not their son. It is just memories of, of right. really awful shit that's happened to them. Um, yeah. And I think it's it, and I almost want to say too. I want to go out and uh, so far as to say that again, kind of like what I was talking about before, like with the. Um, 
the 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 dark subject matter Mm -hmm. that it deals with it's almost like putting it framing it in a ghost story Mm -hmm. makes it so you can get this movie out to as many people and send this message yeah because for every one of us are going to sit there and look at it like this is an amazing ghost movie and it is an amazing Mm -hmm. movie about people who are haunted it is more so an amazing story and an amazing way i think it opens a gateway for people to learn about some of the awful things the real awful things that are going on over in the sudan because again this is something that is legitimately hitting uh a real note and striking a chord with some people so hopefully in addition to entertaining people and scaring people it does get them educated informed on something that is happening that we really wouldn't know about and because it's not in our own backyard right and and i think that's something that and i'm not gonna try to uh, pronounce the monster i'm not good at the the words but you basically not to spoil it but it's kind of like a type of ghost that you get from it's almost like peeking into a different um culture aspect you know yes like we say it's like every country has their own type of poltergeist right or, their own legend their own folklore right and this is something that is pulled from uh uh, I don't know if it's just African or Sudanese um, mm-hmm. folklore, but it's like it is. Uh, it is very much. It's not pulled from the traditional. Obviously, the the Western world, the the European folklore. You know, the fairy tales that were told. This is something uh, from a completely different culture. Like Natalie said, that mm-hmm. we don't really get a glimpse into too often. Yeah. So it's nice and refreshing to see that because it's it's kind of you kind of get tired of hearing like. The same fucking demons, the same right. Latin inspired yeah, demonic names that we always. Yeah, there's a lot of always... a lot of Catholic Church right. type yeah. stuff. So it's you like know? it's nice to see something outside of that. It's nice to see that, but it's also and as I was scrolling here, uh, they also call it the Night Witch in the movie, um, also played by Javier Botet. Um, but is it really? Yes. The one in his house is played by Javier yes. Botet as well? Yeah. Fuck Remember me. Remember when it comes up out of the floor? Fuck me. Yeah. Javier's always getting in on these movies. <laughs> I was going to say, he's on a lot oh, of these. God. But Javier Botet and Doug Jones like just live rent best. free in my head. And they, <laughs> they know do. it. They both know it. But Javier's, uh, clearly, he plays a lot of different ghosts for us. Um, but, you know, it's also one where, you know, you're talking about the the typical haunting have to have the church come and like they figure this shit out themselves um and it's a beautiful movie it's a tragic you know just melancholy vibe the whole way but it's also i felt like i gained something from this movie other than just watching another ghost movie right it because it's not just like any other ghost movie no, not it is all. something completely different and it is scary like there it's scary oh, it is <laughs> yeah it it will Definitely, it's chilling. I mean, it is. some of the some of the stuff was is is really yeah. It, it, again, like Natalie said, it's genuinely terrifying. It has a great mm-hmm. message, mm-hmm. and you can really take a lot from it. Right. But it is genuinely uh, uh, horrific. Yeah. Horror film. Now, so we've talked about a lot of you know the the kind of really scary, very grounded ghosts. I just want to go fully the fucking other way here. Talk Let's about one it. of our favorites and where we get a lot of scary ghosts that aren't too realistic. 13 ghosts. 13 ghosts. I w- we can't do a ghost episode being the millennials that we are and right. not talk about 13 ghosts. Exactly. Like those those late 90s, early 2000s horror reboot movies like 13 Ghosts and House on Haunted oh, Hill. Yeah, I was going like to say. Like those fucking movies were... <sighs> They were a mood because, like we said, they they were those movies that had the sexy cast. Oh yeah, and like you know, like in the forefront, and it's mm-hmm. just like like model looking people. Like you couldn't right, just be an get... average looking person in a horror movie anymore. Now no, we no, had no. to have supermodels and like these legitimate theater quality actresses. Because mm-hmm. remember, before that, horror was very schlocky, and it was just like, yeah, hey, but we your like cousin knows a dude who's a roommate with an actor. Well, we got a fucking movie for him. <laughs> exactly. And then Jason chased you down and killed you. But we couldn't right. have that anymore. So late no. 90s, early 2000s, specifically 2001, mm-hmm. we get 13 ghosts. Yes. And, of course, one of my all-time favorite hunks, Matthew Lillard, is in this movie. How can you not love Matthew Lillard? Right. He's just an all-around amazing person. He's uh, up there with Brendan Fraser as far absolutely. as, like, most loved and adored celebrities. Protect him at all costs. Protect him at all, yes. But you also get the Zoinks. beautiful <laughs> Shannon Elizabeth in her prime. 
um, you know, doing the the daughter who's just like, oh yeah, look at the big pretty house. Right, Never just mind this that the walls like are ditzy glass. fucking the dumbest like daughter in a movie. Right. I, one of the dumbest daughters I've ever seen in a movie. Like we could do a whole episode on dumbest daughters in horror yeah, right. movies because well, I mean, it's like you know it's the perfect subject for the genre. And my, but uh, as far as the cast goes, my mom would not. Let Me Live, if I didn't mention the amazing performance by Tony Shalhoub. Yes. Uh, who, uh, if you don't recognize him from 13 Ghosts, you'll recognize him from the greatest detective show of all time, <laughs> Fucking Monk. Um, it's the best for a reason. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Tony Shalhoub, actually very entertaining in this movie, too. A hundred percent. I just love... All of the ghost designs and every yeah. like behind the scenes. Biggest strength of the movie easily uh, is the way yeah. is the design of all like, of the ghosts. Once you get past the shitty opening dialogue and the panning scene to give you, oh no, there was a fire and the mom died all in the opening credits. That o- one of the worst opening credits it's in a just fucking bizarre. horror movie it's, ever. It's bizarre, but I mean, I guess it's better than super obnoxious dialogue be like but don't don't you remember when our mom died in a fire i would rather have the super obnoxious dialogue (laughs) instead of the whole like like the feeling was like bro we got like two minutes left and we haven't even told the story about how the mom died what do we do (laughs) um we haven't done the opening credits yet right well fuck it just put it in a living room and pan it opening credits there's gonna be pictures and then it's gonna be packed boxes what you want to tell the whole story about the mom in the opening credits the fuck did i say why aren't you moving go so that is enter shitty apartment and then it goes into really bad dialogue yeah, they breakfast. still have a housekeeper no, nothing about the fucking movie makes sense the most sense. unbelievable part about this is that they left they, <laughs> they're the broke mom, their mom as dies fuck. they're broke for some fucking reason they're broke because of the insurance um, duh they live in america they got fucked by the insurance company <laughs> duh and then they all look like they're living in a two-bedroom apartment but they still have a fucking nanny even though the daughter is clearly a teen who's capable of taking she's care of clearly 28 year old shannon elizabeth <laughs> but no dad i'm clearly only like 15 year old teenage daughter but Right. It was one of those fucking movies. Like, why did every late '90s, early 2000s but horror movie have the worst fucking we aged cast? Love it. We love every second of fucking it. Fucking Freddie Prince Jr. played a 18 <laughs> year old until he was 45. Let's be fucking real. Hey, he can do whatever he wants. Uh, sure. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, as much shit as we give it, but as you can tell, we're having a lot of fucking fun, and we will preach till we're blue in the face that. If you can have fun watching a movie that has the shittiest opening and weird casting like that, then it's a and fucking good movie. And let's not even get into movie. the fucking house. Right. Come on. No oh. one's going to be like, oh, this is normal. A glass house with all these ancient markings on it. What right. could go wrong? Right. Exactly. But again, let's focus on the good and the positive, yes. and that is the design the of design. the ghost. Mainly the jackal. The jackal. And everyone is always scared of this. It's definitely one of my scariest ghosts. Um... He's terrifying. He's fast, the way he moves. But the thing that, you know, recently made him even scarier for me is um, there was someone on TikTok, and fuck, I wish I had found them first. But they were going over a lot of the backstories for the ghosts that I think you can kind of get from the We'll try to give a shout out on our TikTok at a later date as far as this content creator. But Uh, yes, they gave a a glimpse into the history. And I think this was even included, some of this was included in like a DVD. It's a DVD or a little book or something like that. Yeah, if you want to know more about the ghosts, yes. Um, But, you know, it gives kind of like the human stories of these ghosts. And like the Jackal was a crazy ass um, SA murderer. And the it, it kind of, it made the movie better to me because I always remember watching it and thinking when the jackal is attacking and they do like the close up of Shannon Elizabeth when her shirt rips and her boobs almost come out. <gasps> boobs. And you just thought it was because of the time, that's what everybody wanted to do. They're like, well, they'll watch it if there's some boob. There needs to be bobs and vagine in right. these movies. Nobody will watch <laughs> if they don't have bobs and vagine. But finding out that he actually attacked women uh, kind of brings more to that scene and makes him even fucking scarier. Yeah, the, the stories behind the ghost, and it's it's one of those things I think a lot of people, uh, here we are 21 years later as of the mm-hmm. recording of this episode, and people are clamoring for, oh, I think they could do more with the 13 ghost concept. I think one popular thought and theory that's been running around is that if you were to do it again or reboot it or anything... Mm-hmm. Do it as like an episodic television show oh, where we amazing. learn about the history of the ghost. You could literally do 
13 episodes about 13 different ghosts. And yeah, then, just give us one season so Netflix right, can't Almost like it. an anthology. Right, yeah, there you go. Let's, yeah, exactly. Let's not make this multiple seasons. Netflix going to shit can it anyway. Uh, but yeah, like you could do 13 episodes focusing on 13 ghosts. It's almost like an anthology mm-hmm. series. Uh, I've seen that theory floated around uh, before, and I think that'd be great because I think, like we said, obviously... The rest of the movie is just kind of shit. It, I mean, let's yeah, be real. It's, 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 it's a, got an interesting concept in it. It's just yep. not delivered as well, I think. And, you know, not to, to shit on it, you know, completely. Because we joke about the glass house. But honestly, let's talk about that set design. is fucking unreal. It is gorgeous. But, you know, you get a lot of weird, shitty one-lighters. But as a package, it's just... It's so fun. Like the it is, lawyer it is getting fun. cut in half. Oh, that's my favorite kill. <laughs> One of my favorite kills in all of horror movies is when the fucking lawyer gets split in half by the glass. It's so, so good. good. It's One, so if good. If you don't believe me, go watch 13 Ghosts right now. It's like that lawyer scene. It, it more than makes up for any of the other shit in the yes, movie. 100%. Yes, hundred it, It's it's one of those movies where you still had bad cheesy acting. Right. Even though you had great actors like Tony Shalhoub and Beth Davids mm-hmm. and uh, F. Murray Abraham, fucking F. Murray yeah, Abraham, right, right. Um, even gets in on the action, and it's like you had, and and of course Matthew Lillard. <sighs> but yeah, you've got this like this movie where it's like you have these great actors, but it's like ultimately at the end it was just a victim of the time. I think it was mm-hmm. just. You know, that studio wanted a kind of a teen slasher ghost movie. And yeah. it, while it got the ghost aspect right, you could tell there was a lot of that studio interference that we saw back in the day that these movies were so famous for. <laughs> right. And I think, you know, we, we talk again about it being schlocky, but we eat that shit up. Oh, yeah. So. That's why we're horror fans. Yeah. If you haven't realized from any of our other episodes that we love schlocky, oh, shitty yeah. horror movies, mm-hmm. um, then, yeah, I mean, we you haven't been listening. So, right. yeah, keep, yeah. Get with it. Right. You know, talking about the jackal kind of made me think, though, you know, it is one of the scariest ghosts, I think, for a lot of people and definitely one for me. I think my other super scary by noise alone is Kayako from The Grudge. And also, you know, we kind of mentioned it. It is a ghost story. Uh, Japanese horror is an absolute delight. And I think the first Grudge movie, at least, did pretty good um, as an American adaptation. Um, you know, the people that they worked with... It was a lot of the same people involved right, exactly. uh, from Juwan. And I think so, yeah, that's, one what, of the, yeah, that's what, that's what, made it what makes it such a faithful adaptation. Yeah, and obviously, you know, it kind of it teetered down, and uh, we still haven't seen the most recent Grudge movie, the kind of soft reboot. I don't soft know exactly. Soft reboot sequel, legacy sequel, requel, whatever you want to call <laughs> exactly. it. Exactly. Uh, yeah, we haven't seen that one. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, the, uh, the the 2004 Sarah Michelle Gellar grudge movie, mm-hmm. uh, one of my all-time favorites. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's, it's funny. Like, it was such a big deal when it came out. Um, but you look at it and it didn't really... It didn't go too far, but I don't think it had to go too far. Mm-hmm. It was one of those perfectly... Like you get some gruesomeness to it, you get some, yeah. you get some good jump scares. You get, but really, it's it's a tremendous, it's it's a terrific story. It's great yeah. storytelling, mm-hmm. and you know it, the 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 story is probably comes first and foremost. And like we were talking about with the slow burn horror movies, mm-hmm. um, I've noticed some of those more story driven, narrative centric films become like what we've talked about comfort movies. And mm-hmm. I would easily put the grudge as one of my comfort movies right? because it does follow that very structurally sound kind of uh, uh, story heavy films. Yeah. And you know, I would say that is a kind of bizarre because there's the scene of her crawling down the stairs groaning. Oh, but the Exorcist is one of our comfort movies, and right. she also runs down the stairs and right. goes ah. So, <laughs> so and you, you know, saying if are... I cut the head off this chicken? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're no, not allowed to that's say another, that. On that's here. another episode for <laughs> another day. Yeah, so it's our that's our that's a little uh, preview of a future. If Rob anybody Zombie listens episode. to this and gets that. Please let us. If you know. get that reference, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> give us a shout out on TikTok I don't or wanna, email us. I don't want to get. I don't want to get. I, I don't know if we can say that. Can we no, say? We're that? not gonna go with the full joke. Um, but if you get it just off that one little line, <laughs> yes, yeah, by all means. But yeah, the uh, the grudge is awesome. Um, she 
is one of the ones that kept me up. I remember that when I went to the theater yeah. and I saw The Grudge, and this was back when you could like do the cool midnight openings and give you free shit. And I came home with a poster and I immediately put the poster on my wall. I thought it was so cool. And it was just the one where it was like the hair with her eye, you know? Right. The one that was everywhere became the right. DVD cover, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. And I the remember Ivory Kayako it alone. It freaked me out just having a poster in my room. Yeah. I, like, I couldn't like look at it before bed because I would just think of that noise. But it 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 also and the little kid with the meowing but also just you know seeing the type of ghost that you have that they come about out of you know this japanese folklore of when a crime that's so violent is committed that it creates these angry spirits. Right. It's not just a ghost. It right. evolves and escalates beyond that, and it is a grudge. Yeah. And then they just want to fuck you up. Like, you're in my house. You're yeah. gone. Yeah. It's almost like um, what Poltergeist did 20 years uh, before that, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. It's like it kind of it kind of like took what Poltergeist had established mm-hmm. and built upon that. Or, you know, gave it more of the... Um, a Far East influence with the right. culture over there. Well, it's it, like what we were talking Japan. about with his yeah. house. You just get, it's kind of a similar legend, but from different countries. Right. I think that's why we like it because it is something different, mm-hmm. you know, than what we typically see. And, you know, the original, and I've not, I don't think I've ever seen all of the original Japanese films. I think I've only seen the first Juon, but also uh, The Ring and Ringu, which are also ghost with stories. Sadako and Samara. Yeah, for Sadako the, and Samara. Uh, United States audiences. Yes. Um, also, kind of a sad, kind of weird, creepy, very moody. The Ring is one of those movies that's just the whole film is blue, and I love it. Yeah, oh you know, yeah, it's, it's become you know, well-known uh, discussion point about the film is mm-hmm. that, that tint, that, that filter that Gore Verbinski put on the film itself. I think mm-hmm. it's, it's, there was something, there's a, there's a reason behind that. And forgive me. I forget the exact reason, but it was almost something to do with the atmosphere to help create the, the vision. And uh, the fact that the film takes place in Seattle, which is historically very rainy, right. high precipitation there. It's like um, the creepy version of the Twilight filter. Right, but for... I think, yeah, I think, again, <laughs> he wanted to more capture the yeah. feel of downtown Seattle, which is right. where a lot of these kind of stories take place. It does just, it kind of gives it almost a little bit of gloom to it. Yeah. You know, a coolness, um, you know, because everything does feel kind of weird in that movie. Yeah. Um, there's nothing warm and fuzzy about it. No, it's So very kind of cool. having those tones yeah. kind of almost sets the mood for what you're watching, especially, yeah. you know, um, scenes where she's out at the island or at yeah. the cabin, things like that. You know, and then you just get that stark red light from the sunset, I think, yeah. for the tree. Yeah, and I think I think Gore Verbinski doesn't get enough credit for being such an auteur kind of director. You know, we've talked about We Love the Ring, but we also, a movie that I think we'll get into in the future that you'll find out that we love is A Cure for Wellness. Yeah. And his directorial style, you know, I think he also directed some of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, unfortunately. I won't hold that against him, but, you know, <laughs> um, that was that kind of lends itself to kind of how he is as a director. He is, yeah. uh, and The Ring, I think, perfectly demonstrates that. Right. Uh, speaking of great directors who do terrific ghost stories, you touched upon it earlier, but I want to talk more about it. And I want to talk Mama. Mama. Mama is one of my favorite ghost movies. Um because we were talking about it earlier with the shitty parents, and basically right, the movie right. starts off with a guy who is like this, uh, like he's a banker or like an investment guy, mm-hmm. loses all of his money, and then goes on a uh, fucking rampage, kills his, uh, kills his wife, and then mm-hmm. takes his two daughters out to the middle of nowhere, um, in a cabin that they own, and he's about to kill them, but they are saved by a ghost named only Mama. Mama. And uh, yeah, Mama. Also Javier Botet. Obviously, yeah. Also Javier Botet. He'll come up a lot in all of these movies. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep pointing them out, right? I love uh, him. But yeah. So then, then the uh, two girls are raised in the wild by mm-hmm. Mama, this ghost, and they become feral, and they are discovered, and then they are put in the custody of their uncle, who is the twin of their dad. So it's the same mm-hmm. actor, Nikolai. Coaster Waldau, mm-hmm. you will know as Jamie Lannister from Game of Thrones. Um, and also Jessica Chastain, who we talked about earlier. She popped up in Crimson Peak. She's mm-hmm. just got a good look, look for these creepy ghost movies. She does. She's um, like all alt and baddie in this Right. One. She is uh, she's like something her. else. She's something else. <laughs> Love Jessica Chastain. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they're put in the care of their uncle and his girlfriend. And uh, But uh, the only unfortunate part is 
uh, Mama's not ready to let them go. And then mm-hmm. the whole movie focuses on how Mama tries to keep her grip on these two little girls mm-hmm. um, as they try to reacclimate with the uh, real world. And there's just some of the most disturbing imagery yeah. that I've seen in this movie. It's uh, directed by Andy Muschietti. We who love y- him. We love Andy Muschietti. You'll know he directed It, Chapter 1 and 2, and is directing, if they ever release it, mm-hmm. the uh, the Flash movie that's supposed to come out. Uh, that We still don't know wow. if it's going to see the light of day wow. as of the recording of this episode. Right. Uh, but Andy Muschietti... This is what kind of got him on the map. Mm -hmm. Um, He captured the attention of Guillermo del Toro, coming up again here as a producer. Mm -hmm. Loves these creepy ghost movies. Uh, But he discovered Andy Muschietti, gave him a chance, and produced Mama. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, led Andy Muschietti to all those other future titles that we were talking about. But uh, this is one of my absolute favorite ghost movies, one of my favorite Andy Muschietti movies. Um, And you get to see kind of... uh, You see why they picked him to do the It movies. Yeah. Because what he creates here... What he does with Mama, you see that influence in Pennywise and some of the iterations that he takes on in the It movies. Yeah. Visually, this you you see the inspiration there. Yeah, it's definitely um, the facial um, features of Mama. They I know they made a prosthetic thing that uh, went on to Javier uh, Botet, and then he had like the creepy wig and the gown. Um, but just the way the face is kind of done, warped is. Also inspired again by the art uh, that you get that you see in it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I want to point out: my favorite fucking scene in Mama is easily the scene where the the well, it's not what you're you're making a face, but I know you you don't know where I'm going with this because we've talked about a lot of great scenes. But my favorite scene is the scene where their the kid's grandma comes to basically kidnap them and take them back into her possession because mm-hmm. in the whole one of the subtexts of the movie subplots. Is that the grandma's trying to fight the uncle for custody, but whatever. Uh, so the but the grandma goes to like kidnap the girls, and Mama finds the grandma, and as the girls come down the stairs, they're like, "Oh, it's our grandma!" and turns around and it's fucking Mama who was just put on the fucking grandma's skin. Yeah. Like I'm not even shitting you. She is basically using the grandma as a fucking costume, and it's so fucking disturbing. Um, I fucking love it. Like I like if you have again if you haven't seen it, I think this came out about 2013 2014 somewhere in that mm-hmm. ballpark go find it it's so it's good it's so good and it's another uh kind of tragic family story movie I love like it, we were though. talking I about love earlier. the tragedy behind um, it and the ending scene, is so tragic too it is uh, you were whenever you said your favorite scene the reason I made a face is because I was thinking this scene that you don't even see anyone necessarily on screen I think you see Jessica Chastain on the side it's kind of one of those things that oh, he's good at doing yes. in the periphery yeah where you see her coming down the hallway uh, but in the the little girl's room you see the shadow of her the little girl uh, but she's like floating six fucking feet in the air and yeah. then you kind of see mama's shadow yes but then she like gets put down and runs out and you're just like the fucking what and the because whole time it's before you see her right and the whole time this mama entity in the movie is making fucking predator noises like yeah the like noises clicking tongue I, clicking shit you ass not. noises i thought kaiko was scary and i'm just gonna go ahead and say i'm gonna put mama at number three for my top three scariest fucking ghosts because even though her her backstory is really sad and tragic, she is creepy, and the noises she makes are ten times worse than Kayako. Right, it's like the Predator heat vision noises. It's fucking disturbing. No, it's it's like it's almost like taking that and like the freaky zombies from Left 4 Dead. I've heard that sound oh, all over yeah. TikTok with the Fuck rah, yeah. noises, and she's just really freaky. But it's such a fucking good movie. It is such a good movie. It is, yeah. So uh, we've hit a lot of our favorites here. We'll kind of touch mm-hmm. on a few. Others kind of rapid fire here to yeah. close things out. But uh, one that I watched today uh, that I almost forgot, that I just wanted to brush up on. You know, I, mm-hmm. I just wanted to kind of re- refresh my memory about some of these. And one of them was uh, the Amityville Horror, which I think is probably one of the original OG ghost haunting movies. Yeah, and I don't really remember shit about it. I, we kind of talked about it's this. It's more intense than I thought it really? was. Like, yeah, it's like, I remember thinking back in the day, it was like, it's like, you know, compared to some of the other shit that's out there, like, I was like, why don't I remember that being one of the more gruesome mm-hmm. horror movies? But it's fucking intense. See, I'm going to have to sit down and watch it again, because I remember, um, and I think this was, you know, in the the peak of remakes and stuff, that I went and saw the one in theaters with Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. Um, which I thought was 
still really scary and brilliant. I know some people kind of shit on it, but it's like, it's well, just it was that golden movie. age of the, it's, like I said, the early to mid 2000s where we're right. starting to get those remakes and reboots and but stuff. But it's scary. And, yeah. and, you know, the, the story of Annabelle has always been really creepy. I know people, you know, obsess over it regardless of, you know, all of the things that have come out about the family and being shitty. And you mean that it's bullshit? The bullshit. It was all bullshit. And, you know, all the stuff that those poor kids had to go through with everything. So Shocker. It was all to sell books and movies. What? Oh, what? But I think that's something that I also still love because people still love Amityville. People look at a house and see windows like that, and they're like, that's like the fucking Amityville house. Right. It is iconic, but I just yeah. want to point out it's another long line of bullshit from Ed and Lorraine Warren that people were fed. <laughs> it's like, and yeah. I'm not going to get into it, but maybe one of these days we can kind of talk yeah. about um, how shitty yeah, we Lorraine definitely want to. We want to definitely be able to have episodes where we talk more to the uh, paranormal community right. than they were helpful, in my opinion. Yeah, so, I, we yeah. definitely want to have some real paranormal stuff because, you know, here in Indiana, um, wow, boring. There is more than corn here. There's also ghosts and spooky shit. And, you know, we've kind of uh, gone to some of these cool, spooky places. And that's something we definitely want to talk about on future shows. It's not going to always be horror, where it's everything spooky here. Yeah, and it's uh, it's not just corn-tastic. No. It's ghost-tastic. And so, too. talking about Paranormal, though, a movie that you haven't seen that I'm super excited for you to actually watch, um, based off of a, a Stephen King novel, 1408. Yeah, yeah, I've not so, seen 1408. It's one of the few you know, movies I, that I, that's on this list that I can't speak to. Uh, John, John Cusack, Cusack, Samuel L. Jackson. Not the immediate person you think about for, for being a lead of a Stephen King movie, but he honestly kind of works so his character is basically um kind of a shitty dad uh who writes who who goes around he does paranormal investigations uh he writes ghost books and you know he starts out in book signings and stuff but the thing that you realize early on is that he does this paranormal investigating and writes all these books about all these horrible things he's seen but he actually doesn't believe and shit and he's never seen a fucking thing so it's a really good you know there's a a ton of ghost paranormal shows out there you've got all over the place every every channel has one you know and they can't all there are things in this world we have yet to understand (laughs) fucking zag baggins yeah i liked him in the beginning and he turned into a shit but i digress the thing is with as many ghost paranormal shows that you have out there, there are some people who legitimately want to find things. There's a lot of people who have legitimately, you know, have these experiences and that there's something that's happened. But I feel like there's also a lot of people who are just kind of chasing that fame. And that's how I feel like the character in 1408 is because he's, you know, everyone loves his books. Yeah, He does all this stuff and he's just yeah. trying to find something. And he ends up in this hotel you know, everyone's going, hey, you need to go there. And he gets room 1408 and shit actually hits the fan. Yeah. It, and it's such a good movie. It builds and then it explodes. And it's got a lot of really scary, mind-bending imagery in it. I've seen some of the pictures uh, from the film. Some, mm-hmm. like, uh, some of the pictures, some still shots, uh, sure. basically. Some screen grabs. And I, I remember thinking, wow, the effects in this mm-hmm. look really, really impressive. And it's funny, the reason I was, uh, while you were talking, I was kind of looking up there. Um, this director, whose uh, name uh, I can't pronounce. I'll, I'll just I'll just say what it is. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, I, it seems Icelandic or, or Welsh of some kind. Uh-huh. Very hard to pronounce. Um, but he also directed a film that I have seen called The Right, um, which has, uh, it's kind of a, it's more of a demonic possession mm-hmm. movie, which that's going to be another episode for it. And see, uh, I've not seen the right. right I know but, I've yeah, heard of it, but it's, yeah, the the same director, and it makes sense because again, the visuals alone in that movie are right. also extremely impressive. Well, then one thing with fourteen oh eight that anyone who has seen it, I feel like, kind of comments on. I think there was even someone on TikTok last month. I saw they were like, "I'm staying in this hotel room, and the picture in here is giving me fourteen oh eight vibes," because there's a picture that's hanging that's got a boat on. Uh, the ocean and he starts to see it move like on the ocean in the picture frame and so like you just can't look at those weird old like (laughs) you can't look at like 
boats on the ocean paintings the same anymore after seeing that movie. And what is the shit you have half the time that you see in a hotel room? Can't or go fucking to Long John like Silver's anymore. Boats and flowers, right? Just exactly. Can't, can't go. Can't go get those hush puppies anymore. No have more to go through the drive-through. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you were you were mentioning. Uh, you know, we kind of touched a little bit on the conjuring with talking about the the parent stuff and the right. warrens you know the conjuring is kind of one of those is it a demon movie is it a ghost movie i feel like it kind of lands both ways and there's a lot of those right yeah there, it's you know it, it it makes you makes you think about how some of these ghost movies overlap with these demonic possession movies mm -hmm. like the exorcist kind of feels like a ghost movie but it's more demonic possession right same thing with other exorcism movies like exorcism of emily rose the last exorcism mm -hmm. all those in a way feel like ghost movies be but you know they're really they're really when you get down to it they're not right um but yeah then you have that overlap with stuff like the conjuring because mm -hmm. you think about it and the story of uh, while this, while the original story is more demonic possession, like in the mm -hmm. first movie, the parent family, yeah. uh, then you get into the second movie where you have Bill Wilkins, who is more of a traditional ghost. Right. He's just, uh, being used by Volokh's de demonic right. presence, basically. And I think I like movies like that. And I feel like they would just fall under the paranormal blanket. Right. Um, exactly. You know, but you've got stuff like that. You have Insidious and lights out where you also kind of want to go are they really ghosts are they in like what would you call them are they dark entities are they yeah. demons are they otherworldly beings mm -hmm. and i like i kind of like the movies where you don't quite know exactly what they are um because lights out it's like you know she she died and she's there but she can like do stuff to people in the shadows she's also you know it's like yeah it's very ambiguous right with it with lights out you know what exactly yeah. diana is and that's another movie. If you haven't seen, check it out. It's fun and yeah. it's scary. Um, also, check out the original short film that inspired it. That yes, alone was terrifying. Yes. Um, honestly, almost more. <laughs> right. You know, what, yeah, I, I would agree. I think. Yeah, with. I think the movie almost toned uh, down what you what what was so great about that short film. And I'm having one of those moments. Like I, I have to say it. I have to say it. But the woman that is in the original short for Lights Out is also the woman in the beginning of the movie. Uh, who's turning the light on and off as she's leaving work? Right, and the she same way she, she does in the short film. Yeah, it's yeah. it's very it's a very cool callback. Super cool. Uh, but yeah, it, we've yeah we've we've hit a lot of the ones I think we want to hit. Um, oh yeah, there is one that we didn't talk about that I think deserves its own episode because we're gonna start looking into some more franchises yes. here in the future. Yes, and kind of breaking down some of those films. Uh, but Ghostbusters, which I think was something that was hugely influential mm -hmm. to both of us, yeah. with what what inspired us to really love ghosts, eighties babies, and supernatural <laughs> films and stuff like that. Yeah. Ghostbusters, but really, when you think about it, all those films, all four, all four films, mm -hmm. really deserve and the to, TV show and the TV show, and just you know they really deserve their own episode because I mean I think that was that was a franchise that had more of an impact on us and still has an impact on us right. with watching Afterlife. Afterlife Afterlife you know, did things to me dude. Right. Like, we're we're just gonna go on record saying Afterlife is uh just a worthy successor. Yeah. And just it does so much good for the Ghostbusters canon and the mm -hmm. and really makes me think the future is bright and why wouldn't it be? I mean it's Ivan Reitman's son right. Jason you know, leading us into this new era of yeah. Ghostbusters movies. Yeah. So we will definitely talk more about Ghostbusters, but please know it was hot. It is high on our list, but it just, it, we feel like it deserves, it's kind of in a class of its own. It does. Cause you know, there's a lot of movies from our childhood that molded us, obviously Beetlejuice being a huge one. It's also a, a ghost movie. Yes, um, absolutely. You know, you get just more of a funnier take on yeah, a ghost funnier movie. take. And, and you, you get kinda, all like types I said, of ghosts. Yeah. Like I said, with uh, when we were talking about Adam Stovall and a ghost weights and how mm -hmm. his style is very reminiscent of Tim Burton. The whole movie is very, it feels like a love letter to Beetlejuice. A bit, yeah. So when you watch, uh, if you watch a Ghost Waits, I think a great double feature is watch a Ghost Waits and watch Beetlejuice. Right. And I think you get, you I mean, you those two feel like spiritual siblings. They do. Um, I think also with the the love story that you have through those both of those movies, right. they of definitely they, they feel like they're in the same vein. Yeah, mm -hmm. and yeah, we, one's we, just really fucking colorful. Yeah. one's in black and white. <laughs> and we'll, uh, and yeah, we'll probably talk about Tim Burton and Beetlejuice and a right. lot of his influence on the yeah, horror. Yeah, Tim Burton. World. You know, it, I know it's it's everywhere you look now is Nightmare Before Christmas. But when I was a kid, it was different. I remember my mom didn't even want me to watch that movie because she thought it was 
creepy and right. weird to involve Halloween and Christmas. If any of you can imagine a world without shitloads of uh, Nightmare Before Christmas right. merch, that's what we grew up in. Yeah. And I Back know a lot then, of you are like, how yeah. did you guys survive? Because <laughs> anytime I turn because around. Because we frequented the old Hot Topic and Suncoast to see if there was merch around truth, Halloween. Truth. Now it's year round. Buying CDs anywhere, at everywhere. Sam Goody. Y'all don't even know about that life, son. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely, you know, I know we've kind of, I, I shit on more of his recent work for different reasons, but his old stuff, you know, is, it's shaped a lot of our generation and even new generations. Uh, that yeah, I and see he tells a lot of ghost stories. I mean, love. hell, Corpse Bride is yeah. a great ghost story. Yeah. Uh, but I always think of, you know, with Tim Burton, you know, I, I, I will go on record as saying everything from after Sleepy Hollow and before Miss Peregrine yeah. was pure, unadulterated shite. And yeah. I will fucking stand by I, it. I kind of hate, and I know we're going to kind of shift off for just a second, but I'm just going to have to say it. Yeah, we, I, we, I, I this is our that. show. Guess what? <laughs> Guess what? It's our show. If you don't You're like it, here. If you, you can hit the stop button and move on to another episode. We're going to keep talking about this shit. But, but it, what I do want to say, and you know, Sleepy Hollow in itself also, one I didn't think of that's a ghost story. The Headless Horseman right. is the ultimate ghost story. The right. tale of Ichabod. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's again, one of ours that's been done from cartoon to cartoon to cartoon. Everyone yeah. has, I mean, that's here in probably Indiana, one of my favorite Disney films is the, is the tales of oh, Ichabod yeah. and Mr. Toad. Absolutely. When they tell about the legend of Sleepy Hollow, I adore it. But I mean, even, you know, here we've got Connor Prairie for their Halloween. They always have the headless horseman hayride. Like it's everywhere and yeah. everybody knows it. Everybody loves it. Um, but Sleepy Hollow is probably one of my favorite Tim Burton movies, but I do agree. I, I hate that. I love his, his vision and his imagination, yeah. but it's just gone into, you know, he got my, way too commercial. Let's my be big real. issues though, is when you look at his older movies and then you look at the new ones that are just all fucking CG. And I'm sorry, I like CG, but for Tim Burton, it's just way cooler to see the cool prop design that he wants to do and actually see his visions on screen and not just CG chaos. Right. Cause yeah, I think what a thing like you Alice said, in Wonderland. I'm sorry. I hate those movies and I love Alice in Wonderland. Well, yeah, we, we, yeah, we adore the original stories yeah. from Lewis Carroll, but um, I think with Tim Burton, one thing that got really, and we will talk about with these ghost movies too, is mm -hmm. you'll notice a lot of these movies have, you will have CGI, but they don't get mm -hmm. over reliant upon it. Right. And I think uh, that that's just one thing that we'll talk about just in films that we love and mm -hmm. enjoy. I don't like when there's too much CGI. And I'm not sitting here shitting on CGI. CGI no. has its place and is necessary. It's just when you can tell it's too much. I go back to that story about um, Sir Ian McKellen being on the set of the Hobbit movies. Yeah. And he literally got up in the middle of a scene and yelled at Peter Jackson, this is not why I got into acting. I want to I, I want to be around people. Right. And all of his scenes required CGI because it was him and the Hobbits. Yeah. And, and the hobbits had to be filmed differently than him because of the ratio of how the how the hobbits are so short and he would be so big in comparison to them. Yeah, but then you also you watch some of the old stuff where they just filmed in different perspectives to get the same thing. It's almost like CGI with, you know, you hire 10 artists to go make the scene happen. Um, and then you don't have to build a long table and do, you know, a depth perception scene to make the hobbit look small. Right. And I feel like that's happened with a lot of not just Tim Burton movies, but movies across the board where I don't, I don't have a problem with CGI and even bad CGI. I'm like, whatever. It doesn't really bother me unless it's absolutely horrendous. And you're like, I kind of feel bad for the movie right. studio for this. Um, uh, like Superman beard. Uh, oh Myers yeah. Yeah. The, the shit, super, you know? yeah. Henry Cable's mustache. The, the yeah. bad Michael Myers mask yeah. also, but yeah, Oh yeah. Michael Myers mask from H2O. I think, you know, kind of going full circle here. To Crimson Peak. That's the what way, I was just getting ready to say. Yeah, it, the way like, yeah. those CGI ghosts were done, phenomenal. Right, and even though some of them had, you know, people, uh, you know, doing the the motion, or yeah. they had partial costumes on, and they were just kind of edited to make them a little bit more see through and wispy. You know, I love seeing that. I am a sucker for practical effects, no matter how shitty it looks. Um, I'm here for it, and I just right. think if you can make it happen, that's what I. I love more in a movie than yep. seeing it in CG. Yeah. So in, and so all these ghost movies that we mentioned today, you can pretty much rest assured there's not too much CGI to it because I agree. Right. I think that does take the effect out of it. So 
Uh, but that's, yeah, that's that's it. That's all the time we have for today. We yeah. appreciate you joining us for another great episode. Thank you for listening to us rant and ramble and <laughs> just say all sorts of stupid bullshit. So uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, on that note, we will leave you with this. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters! Thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes drop every weekend. Follow us on TikTok at HorrorzoidPod and send emails to HorrorzoidPod at gmail.com with your thoughts, questions, and stories for us to read on a future episode. To all our Zoids out there, stay scary.